I'm Dr. Sharita Golden, Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine. We created this educational series for you on the COVID-19 vaccine because we want you, our employees, to be able to make the most informed decisions for yourself. We have gathered experts across our organization to contribute to this video series, and we welcome you to watch either the entire series or just those components that are most relevant to you. Thank you. When uh, COVID-19 um, started, uh, when the pandemic uh, came to the U.S., um, it, it became quickly evident that it, that it really was having a, a big impact on uh, both African-American and Latinos uh, in the U.S. And, and some of the earlier um, sort of signals were really from the lay press. Um, and, and these are some examples of, of the types of um, articles that were coming out from different areas of the country. Um, this is uh, data from uh, the COVID uh, race and ethnicity tracker, which is actually a, a helpful link um, that, that outlines disparities in race and ethnicity by cases um, um, throughout the country. And these are some examples of the location here. And what, what this tells you, what this graph um, tells you is this is the place, this is what proportion of, of all of these locations, for example, in DC, 11% of, of the population is Latino, in Maryland is about 10%. And this is the percentage of COVID uh, cases that have been diagnosed among Latinos in these areas um, and as of today. So for example, uh, Maryland has 10% of the population in Maryland is Latino. If there were no disparities, you would expect about 10% of the COVID cases to be among Latinos, but it's almost, it's twice as much. It's 25, 21% of cases right now are among Latinos. And if you look through these different states, some of them, of course, like Florida have more, a larger Latino population, and some of them like Tennessee have a smaller Latino population, but you can see that the percentages of cases among Latinos are always much higher than what you would expect just by their representation of the population alone. And that just uh, highlights the, that, that there really have been uh, many more cases than, than, than would have been expected if everything were equal. This shows the excess mortality uh, in 2020. So this was, a, this was the, a study done by the CDC and basically what they looked like, they, they looked like how many more people died this year in 2020 than last year um, for all reasons, not just from COVID, but from anything. And what they found is, you know, unfortunately, because, um, because of this year and COVID, uh, there have been excess mortalities in all groups. So, so there have been more deaths than would have been expected uh, in all groups. Uh, but you can see once again, a big difference for people of color. So among whites, it's been about a 12% excess mortality, uh, but much higher, about a third and almost 50% excess mortality uh, for both the, uh, Blacks, Asians, Native Americans, and Hispanics. So of course the question is why is this happening? And uh, Dr. Uh, Damani already talked a little bit about this and I'm gonna uh, um, talk a little bit about it um, in the context of Latinos. And uh, let me just say, I think there are many reasons. Um, one of, I'm gonna categorize this in several reasons. One of them is economic. So, and this one I think is critical and, and, and Domani already talked about this. Uh, low wage essential workers really were hit very heavily with COVID-19 when people, um, many people had the luxury of being able to stay home, especially when cases were really going up. Uh, those who have low wage, uh, who are low wage earners, some of them didn't have uh, the luxury of being able to stay home. They were essential workers that had to go to work um, and, and, and sometimes working in, in crowded conditions. Um, the other thing is that a lot of times uh, these low essential workers um, have live in crowded housing. Um, so this is a way that people um, save for rent. Um, sometimes uh, people don't have transportation to go to work and they have to go either in public transportation or even worse, sometimes they are picked up in vans uh, where they're taken to a, a, a location, but there's many, many people cramped up in one place uh, going to work. Uh, for, for Latinos who, are, who have families abroad, um, many of them have remittance obligations, meaning they have to send money back to support not only their family here, but their family back in, in their country of origin. And, and for many of them, that was a huge uh, reason for them to continue to work. 
And then there's the fear of medical bills, particularly for those who don't have proper insurance coverage. Um, so here's just a, um, uh, a graphic showing where do Latinos work uh, in what are the most common occupations among Latinos in the US. And you can see construction, uh, repair, maintenance, and personal laundry services, um, some of the, the, these, these administration support, waste management, healthcare and social assistance is also high up there. And, and this is people who work in the healthcare systems like Hopkins, but also uh, a large representation in home health aids and other types of uh, work that um, is really uh, also very high risk in terms of COVID exposure and then transportation. And, and a lot of these occupations, as you know, uh, were essential, but also couldn't be done remotely. Um, the, the other issue is legal. And um, although, uh, of course, among the Latino population in the US is quite varied, and there are many, many more Latinos in the US who have been born in the US and those who are immigrants and have not been born in the US, uh, actually a large number of uh, uh, families in the US have someone, have members who have not been born, who are foreign born. Um, and, and as immigrants, um, people may or may have or not have access to certain things, and especially those who are immigrants and don't have the proper uh, documentation of papers. Um, so for, uh, because of that, uh, some workers who were essential workers didn't have the right protections and didn't feel that they could actually uh, complain because they were worried that, that that could have implications for their own immigration status. Those who don't, who are immigrants, and especially those who don't have the proper paperwork, they don't get employment, unemployment benefits or stimulus checks. So when, when, when many people were able to stay home and at least uh, survive because they were going on getting unemployment benefits or the stimulus check, there were many who did not uh, have that. And so um, if, as you can imagine, people who uh, are not making a lot of money may not have a lot of savings and, and they just had to work. Um, I, as you'll see in the next slide, a lot of people who are immigrant are also not eligible for health, health insurance. And, the, uh, and people uh, in that situation are often very worried about being separated from their families or deported. And so for those reasons, they may not use um, the health system. And then finally, there's other barriers that are specific that, that, that really can impact how someone interacts with, with the health system and how someone protects themselves. And for example, language was a huge issue at the beginning of the pandemic. There were lots of uh, information coming to people, but much of that information was in English or, or there were lines like COVID lines that people could call, but, but they didn't have uh, any facility for people who didn't ha speak English. And so that made it really hard for people to get care. Uh, if, if you can imagine if someone has never been to, uh, to use the healthcare system because they didn't have healthcare, um, when they got sick, they didn't really know where to go and what to do. And, and so what, we're see, what we really saw, um, which, um, and, and, we, and in talking to patients, we heard it over and over again, were that some people, many, many people, uh, many Latinos were getting sick and they didn't know where to go. They were afraid that if they went to the hospital, they would be stuck with a huge medical bill. They felt like they had to go to work. Um, and so for all these reasons, they avoided care and they never, uh, it, they didn't get the right information to prevent uh, this tragedy from unfolding. So all of this has, I think, huge implications for vaccines. Um, you know, as, as, as Damani talked about, there are, there are things that we know we can do now, uh, like using masks and distancing um, and, and washing our hands to stay safe. But now there's a vaccine coming. There may be more vaccines and you'll hear more about it um, in a second. And, but you can imagine that for a group of people who have felt uh, that, that things were not accessible to them, healthcare, basic things were not accessible to them. And, and, and sometimes that things that, uh, that, uh, that accessing some things may, may have bad consequences, they may be afraid. Or, or you know, all of these, um, these things can also cause a lot of mistrust, as you can imagine. You know? So if, if you are always worried, uh, particularly those who are immigrant, that, that you may get deported, may se be separated from your family, you may be mistrustful of government. And so um, that, that actually makes it difficult um, when we're doing a national campaign uh, for vaccines. Um, and there are other reasons. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the reason we are here 
is because we want uh, everyone to, to, first of all, we advocate for, for, for equitable access for everyone. Well, you know, this is a public health emergency and everyone uh, needs to be in it together and have access to anything that we can, we have. Uh, this is super important because it's, uh, we can never um, attack a public health emergency by excluding any group of people. But at the same time, it's really important that people have the right information and the correct information in, in ways that they, they feel that they can understand, um, that they can ask questions. And that's really the main reason uh, that we are here. We, we want everyone to be able to make uh, the decisions uh, with all the information they have, and if they need to ask questions, to be able to ask questions. And I'm just going to end with this slide. Um, this is some uh, work that that I'm very grateful the Hopkins communication team uh, did uh, um, with our team. Um, when the, when when we told them, you know, there are people um, we're seeing patients um, who who have a, who don't get the right information. They're they're not understanding what's happening. They're afraid to come to the hospital. Uh, they think that if they don't have insurance, maybe they can't come or they're not welcome. And, and our communication team did a really great job of developing some information that, that really was mostly information that answered the question that people had. And, and we're hoping that um, through the, this, this uh, presentation, but also future conversations, we can inform everyone in our health system uh, with a, and give them the right tools so that everyone can make the right decision for themselves.